Hello, ladies. Welcome back to another Tea Time Tuesday Bible study. Um, before we get into our lesson, let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, I just want to thank you once again for another day. I thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. I ask, God, that you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive your word on today, God, and that you would just continue to speak to us in those areas where we need to hear you the most. Um, I pray that you would quiet and silence those voices that speak against you and your word, your promises, your testimony, God. And Lord, I pray that you will guide me in this lesson, Lord. Um, Just allow me to be used by you to teach these women, God, and to equip them for the things that you just have for us to do. In Jesus' name, I pray, thank God, and amen. It has been a journey. Um, You know, I wrote about some of it on my blog, you know, but through everything, getting to the point um, where I I don't know, I feel like I've had to kind of grieve, uh, grieve my dreams and my wants, my desires and my plans. Um, But in that, also realizing, like, I'm not really losing anything, right? If God is the one that's taking it away, it's because he's replacing it with something better. He's replacing it with his best. So instead of having that tantrum, like I said, you know, in uh, this Sunday's message, right, Instead of having that tantrum or, you know, feeling bitter about the situation, it's like, just take a moment to really reflect on that. Like, this is God. (laughs) This is is God who is moving and doing things in your life. The one who created you and spoke promises into your life. The one who had a plan before you, before you even came into the world. So if God is the one that is doing some disrupting and moving some things around, it's because it needs to happen in order to make room for the thing that he actually wants you to have, right? The thing that's actually supposed to be there in your life. So, you know, be careful, ladies, that you don't get stuck on stupid. Just <laughs> put it that way, right? Like, looking back now, I just have to laugh at how I was angry for a minute. Like, I can't believe this is really happening. It's like, what are you mad about? Like, when, it was just one day. I had to really take your time to get in the word. It was like, what are you mad about? Like, is God doing these, these things in your life? But, you know, sometimes we become a certain way because we don't know who God is in that area of our life. Or, you know, it actually it's just proof that it's like you're still getting to know God in that area of your life. It's easy to tell God, like I said about blog, you know, it's easy to tell God your will, not mine, as long as it seems like things are lining in accordance with what you want. The minute God comes in and disrupts that and he decides to take a detour, you know, he starts moving you away from the path that you had in mind, then it's like, wait a minute, what's happening? What's this? I didn't want this. Okay, you didn't want this, but this is what you needed. What you was pursuing was worthless, and he's giving you something that is priceless. So what are you complaining about? What are you upset about? Um, I do think it's okay to grieve those things, to allow yourself to really have those feelings, to, to feel. God always gives us space to feel, um, to have those feelings, to go through that kind of mourning, um, mourning process over things in our lives. But then when once you come out of that, it's like I can't stay there, right? I still have to remember that God is good in spite of all of that. And ironically, that's our word for today, right, is the word God. Um, For those who might be new, we are coming from a woman's devotional book, a woman of God, wonderfully made, and we are on week five devotional. Uh, We actually have not 
quite yet jumped into the lesson because we are doing a word study on our base scripture, which is Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Okay. And we have pretty much looked at all those words. Um, well, no, we have looked <laughs> at you know, all those words, right? So let's go ahead. Let's just read it. Okay. In my mind, it's like I could quote it, but y'all know I am. I, I'm nitpicky. <laughs> I feel some type of way about misquoting scripture. It just it bothers me. So let's go to Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one, verse one, and this is coming from the Amplified version. Okay. So Romans 1, chapter 1, I'm sorry, Romans 1, verse 1, Amplified Version. Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called an apostle, special messenger, personally chosen representative, set apart for the preaching of the gospel of God, the good news of salvation. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Amplified. Now, just for the sake of just having that extra all right, let's look at it in the King James because that is originally where we started before we started switching over to Amplified. Okay. So in the King James, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, King James Version, I believe in the ESV, it is set apart to the gospel of God, right? So we've looked at all those words. We know servant is bond servant, right? That means if I'm a bond servant for Christ, I really, it, it, I absolutely, <laughs> God ties back to that testimony I was given earlier, right? I absolutely don't have a will of my own. I don't have plans of my own, okay? If my plans are not in alignment with God's plan, it's a problem. Um, you know, a lot of times it's like, I want to serve you, Lord. Like I said, it's easy to say your will, Lord, right? Or in the scripture, uh, Jesus says, you know, not my will, but thine be done in the King James. Uh, Luke 22, verse 42, I believe. <laughs> right? So Jesus saying that, not my will, but thine be done. It's easy for us to say that until his plans start interrupting ours. As a bond servant, it's like, no, I come up under him. I make my plans to fit his schedule, not the other way around. Well, God, you know, I got things to do. No, not if you a bond servant. Not if you a servant for Christ. Your attitude should be, God, what would you have me do? God, what do you need me to do today? Okay, so we've talked about servant. We looked at Jesus Christ. That was the last one that we looked at, right? <clears throat> Iesus, the anointed one. Right? Uh, Jehovah saves. Or Jehovah saves the anointed one. Yahweh saves the anointed one. Yahweh is salvation, the anointed one. Recognizing Christ by his title. Christos, the Messiah. And we talked about that word, right? Christos, how it comes from Creo, and talking about the olive oil. To be consecrated. Fully giving ourselves to God. Called to be an apostle. Plato's. A divine calling. is like, I didn't put myself in this position. I didn't go pick a position for myself and be like, oh, yeah, you, no. God specifically was like, yep, you, you're going to do this. This, this is going to be your, where I'm going to have you at. An apostle, that messenger, right, sent away from, sent on a mission. Okay? Remember, we're all called to be apostolic. But there are no more apostles because that means somebody would have had to have seen Jesus 
and we don't see him in a vision or a dream, like Jesus had to actually appear to you. <laughs> it's, it's like in right now, like con- in your conscious state, appear to you. But you'd be like, yep, I'm choosing now. Paul's the last one. Okay? Separated, set apart. That boundary, right? Signifying, hey, this one belongs to me. This one mine. Mine. And remember, Jesus said, or Christ set us apart, right? Being set apart by Christ does not give us this entitlement or right to handle people any kind of way. I ain't set apart for Christ. And? And? There's a certain type of humility that should actually come with that. Because, again, in spite of everything that God is, or in spite of everything that I am, God is. Right? Unto the gospel, the good news. Heralding the good news. What is the gospel? We talked about that, too, right before Jesus Christ. The gospel is not only just Jesus' story of this Savior who came, died, and rose for us and is coming back again. It is the Bible itself. Jesus is the Word, right? We have the living Word. You have the living Word in your hands every day or however often that you get in your Bible. However often you listen to your Bible. If you do an audio Bible, you're literally listening to the living Word. Now we're going to get into this word God. So before we get into this word God, right, I want to make sure I make this clear. Remember that this is a word study. So yes, this word, right, is a certain word in the Greek, and we're going to, you know, talk about that. And it is rich. It is a rich word. We are going to be on this word for a while. And even the definitions, you know, that I found, understand, we're talking about God. We are talking about an eternal being who has been here, existed before time began. So you cannot sum God up in a paragraph. You cannot sum God up in volumes and volumes of books. It's not going to happen. Like, you're going to spend the rest of your life getting to know God. Again, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier before we got into this, right? He's eternal. He is forever. So, yeah, you know, we, again, these are basically, like, think of it as foundational type things where we're building our base. And then after that, it is up to you to make the effort to get to know God for yourself. Okay. Um, I don't know why that came up, but let's go there. (laughs) Okay. A lot of times, as believers, we come to church and, you know, and that's great, right? And pastor or whoever, you know, is building, they build that foundation in your life. And then there's nothing on that foundation. It's just a slab after that. Because you're still waiting for somebody else to build on something that you should be building for yourself. Remember that this is a relationship. It's not about what you do. It's not about, uh, you know, how many good points that I check off on my Christian bingo, uh, bingo board. Like, it's not, it has nothing to do with you at all. It's about you pursuing God, and in that, in you getting to know who he is, you see the bigger thing at work, right? It's like, wow. You draw closer and closer to him. You're abiding in him. Okay? It's like, all right, we got this foundation laid. Now it's time to start, you know, start to start building, start making some, you no, know, start doing some repairs, start doing some renovations. 
sometimes, yeah, God has to completely just, we got to tear the whole thing down and start over. Because, again, you, you're talking about people who, because they come, maybe they were raised in a, in a church, they grew up in a church, whatever, but the foundation is jacked up. Your concept of how you think God to be and how God operates and um, this kind of notion like, well, if I do this, then God will give me this, is wrong. It's faulty. You've been built on really warped, uh, <laughs> incorrect doctrine. So it's like, no, nah, we got to start this whole thing over. And that hurts too. When God has to completely come in and demolish areas of your life or the entire thing, it's like, wait, I, no, that, that's got to go. It's got to go. Okay? So this particular word in this verse is the word theos. However, just because you see this Greek word, and remember mostly in the in the New Testament, it is it was written in the Greek, so you're gonna have mostly Greek words. Um I believe every now and then you might have like a Hebrew word or same thing in the Old Testament is originally written in Hebrew. So you might have like a Greek word every now and then, right? But uh, keep in mind, like, yeah, this particular word is theos. Um, according to the, the Strong's Expanded Exhaustive Concordance, it's been used 1,343 times in the King James Version. This word theos is used. 1,343 times. But in spite of that, there are going to be some other times where it may not be Theos. It might be Jehovah. Right? Uh, It might be a a different name altogether. So just keep that in mind. It is a word study. Just repeat that. Again, a word study. We are looking at what it was originally translated from, what it means, what it signifies, and how that relates to this text. And then, okay, now, how does that help my view of God right now? It's like, okay, looking at God now with this information how do I see him? What, what, who is he to me? Who is he in my life? And how do I apply that in my life? Okay? I just, I know it took some time for that, but we, we got to, right? We got to take our time. We got to take our time with, with stuff like this. So, getting into this word theos, like I said, it is used in the King James at least. 1,343 times. Theos. Okay. Now, originally, in the Greek, uh, it meant deity. It still means deity. Right? It was taken, we'll say borrowed, I guess. But the Jews, you know, then took that word and they added the article There are three Greek articles, okay? Kind of like in Spanish, you have four articles. Um, In Hebrew, there are actually way more than three. There's a lot of articles that they have, right? But they have uh, three words specifically that are used with theos to mean the, and it signifies... God as divine deity, right? Excuse me. The supreme divinity. Supreme. Okay. So when it's used with one of those three articles, which, God forgive me, because I'm not sure how to read these, you have ho, hey, and to. But it's using one of those, it signifies, it goes from being just a God, deity, a God, to the God, the supreme divinity. Okay? 
Now, figuratively, it can mean a magistrate. Or, you know, in Hebrew, uh, it can mean very. Okay. Which, again, when we're thinking about the God is simple but also complex, and we're not going to rack them up in a few lessons, okay? <laughs> He's very deep. He's very faithful, very loving, and we will touch, we'll see about getting to those attributes, but those are just things to keep in mind, okay? Magistrate, someone with authority, royalty, right? So, theos as a noun, like we mentioned before, uh, in polytheism, polytheism is basically worshiping several different kinds of gods. Okay, so in the polytheism of Greeks, right, you had Zeus, Hades, uh, Poseidon, Athena, right, those people. But there were so many of them, so many different gods and half-gods and, you know, uh, Greek polytheism that I can't even name them all. So in that, Theos denoted a god or a deity, a god, little g. Little g. <laughs> that is also important. When we see g, when we see the word God with the little g, that's that false God. That's that deity. When we see God written with a big G, that is the God. That is your Savior. The Father. God, the Father. God of the universe. Elohim, Jehovah, Adonai. Our God. Okay, the one true God. <laughs> really want to make that clear. Now, they give us some scriptures, some scripture references. Um, the one that I'm going to read for this time is going to be Galatians. So let's go there. Oop, what's going on? Okay, let's go to Galatians. Chapter 4, and then we're going to look at, it says verse 8, but I want us to read verses 7 to 10, okay? So the main verse is, is 8, right? Galatians verse 8, but we're going to read Galatians chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, okay? And this is the Amplified Version. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, bondservant, but a son. And if a son, then also an heir through the gracious act of God through Christ. But at that time, when you did not know the true God and were acquainted with him, you, Gentiles, were slaves to those pagan things which by their very nature were not and could not be gods at all. Now, however, since you have come to know the true God through personal experience, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you are turning back again to the weak and worthless elemental principles of religions and philosophies to which you want to be enslaved all over again. For example, you observe particular days and months and seasons and years, and actually now that I'm reading it, I think I was supposed to stop at nine. Yeah. <laughs> supposed to stop at nine, but it's okay. Let's just read 11 too. Uh, for I fear, I fear for you that perhaps I have labored to the point of exhaustion over you in vain. Whew. Really, Paul was not having it. He's like, we just went over this. <laughs> we just went over this. And y'all going back to this foolishness? And that was Galatians chapter 4, uh, verses 7 through 11, Amplified Version. So again, looking at verse 8 now. But at that time when you did not know the true God and were unacquainted with him, you Gentiles were slaves to those pagan things which by their very nature were not and could not be gods at all. Remember what kind of people we're dealing with. 
again, these people back in the day, okay, this, or this is a time, right, when people are serving these false gods, ideologies, and things of that sort. And if anything is evident, right, there's always going to be some type of struggle or resistance in our faith walk. It's going to happen. You're going to have those moments where you're going to be tempted to lean back on those things from before instead of pressing into what is, right, which is God's truth. It's easy to believe a lie. Um, That was something I think we talked about for Monday's Bible study. It's easy to go with the lie, but to really believe in God's promise, to really hold on to that means that I'm going to be challenged, especially in those times when it feels shaky. What do I mean by that? If you have somebody who says, you know, I trust God, God, I trust you to be a provider, right? And they're making money, they're doing well. Then the next thing you know, the money dries up. And the situation is looking kind of desperate. If they were somebody who used to be in the streets, what happens? That natural man starts to rise up like, hey, you know how to get it. You know, you know how to go make your money. Like, yeah, you know, God understands, He'll forgive you. Just do what you gotta do. Right? But the God in me, Holy Spirit in me rises up and says, you have to believe that God said what he said, right? That his word is true. God is not like man that he would lie to you. He doesn't renege on his promises. He doesn't fail. He cannot fail. He cannot lie because he is the truth. And if he told you that he's going to do it, he's going to do it. So rather than you trying to go and take things in your own hands, what you are going to do is sit here and you're going to wait on him. You're going to be patient in your waiting. You're going to be working while you wait in faith like, okay, I don't know when he's going to do it. I don't know how he's going to do it. I just trust that he's going to do it. And then, like I said, it's up to me to hold on. So these people, you, you have to understand, they're, they're, you give your life to Christ, and that's true. But then we have to be delivered from a lot of stuff. We have to be delivered from a broken mindset. Again, when things get really hard, when the pressure is really high, what do you do? Do you pray? Right? Do you go and talk to God? Do you go still a moment away and just talk to him? Sometimes you might not be able to say anything but just Jesus. Ooh, God. Ooh, Jesus, Lord. Just call, just call his name, Lord. Or do you drink a lot? Do you go and, and smoke it up? Do you stress eat? Because, again, we, we look at people who do drugs and drink alcohol um, who are promiscuous. We don't think about the people who are gluttonous, who go and, and binge eat or whatever. Like, we don't even think about that. But then our culture is kind of absorbed in that, right? And so, again, going back to this, their culture is immersed in this. This is what you do. And that is the norm. And there was a lot of great stuff going on in these temples. Okay? So he's reminding them. Right? At that time, you didn't know who God was. Right? You were unacquainted with him, as it says in the Amplified. You hadn't been introduced to him yet. And so you were slave to those things which were not of God at all. Now, yeah, we're talking about people who are worshiping, you know, false gods, but don't you know we still kind of do that today? 
Because anything you hold in your heart that it has a higher place than God, that is your God now. It's an idol. God had to reveal to me um, over these past few days, my dreams were an idol. I was making an idol out of my time and my plans. They were idols. How do you know if it's an idol? When God tells you to lay that thing down and you can't, or you try to justify it, or you fight them on it, and again, it's not that you can't, but you won't. It's not about can or can't. It's will or won't. Because you can. You can lay it down. You just don't want to. Right? He starts calling certain things out, and it's like, uh, I don't, I don't, what do you mean? I think I mentioned that on uh, Thursday, right, for one of the, the Spanish Bible studies, and the Lord gave me some examples. And I was like, oh, God doesn't mean that for me. And I think I even said it in the Bible study, like, well, you know, we, those, those are other people that have issues, but, you know, I personally don't. And then the Lord had to, like, check me at the Bible study, like, why do you think I gave you that example? You said, Lord, where are some things I specifically need to work on? That was one of the things I told you to work on. Now you're going to tell me? You're going to try to tell me what you don't need to work on? I got to move on. (laughs) I got to move on. I got to move on. But really take that in. It's like you know it didn't work. You know it was false. Now that you know him, now that you've met him, you have been acquainted. Y'all are acquaintances now. So you've met the true God. You've met the one true God. And you're still trying to go back to the phonies. You're still trying to go back to a broken mindset, to things that did not work, to relationships that died, that should have been over a long time ago, to methods that have proven to be faulty that maybe satisfied you, it pacified you in that moment, but it failed. It still left you feeling empty and sometimes feeling worse than when you started. That put you in a deeper hole than you were before. That's what you're going back to. Never take the enemy for granted, right? We don't want to be afraid of Satan. But we don't want to sleep on him either because he's a very good liar. He's very convincing. And if I listen to him long enough, I will start to believe every lie that he tells me about myself, about his word, about my God. God can't help you out of that. I told you, you know, you know how to, you know how to deal with that. People who uh, have porn addiction. Oh, you feel lonely. You you feel like your partner isn't paying attention to you. You feel like you're just stressed out. Oh, it you know, it's not like you're hurting anybody. What does it matter if you watch that sometimes? Where in the word exactly does it say that you can't watch this? <laughs> That's not saying words. It's like there are plenty of scriptures that talk about how your thoughts are supposed to be pure and holy unto God. And if you're entertaining those kind of things, do you really think your mind is in a holy space? Come on now. Like I said, you if you start finding yourself in a place where you're trying to justify those things, that's an idol. It, it's an idol. You're snared up. And you need God to unbind you from those things. Like we read, right? You want to go back to the stuff that God freed you from. For what? <laughs> okay. So, looking at my time. Y'all, I didn't I mean to stay there that long, but hey, maybe we needed to be there. Maybe I needed that too. Okay. <laughs> at least for me, I needed it. So, looking at this next one, okay? This next definition. So like I mentioned before, right, this word, it says in the, the concordance, this word was appropriated by Jews and retained by Christians to denote 
the one true God. So again, when we, in the Greek, when it's used with an article, okay, it signifies the God. Um, now, in the Greek, I have to go back and look because they have uh, these things called particles and things, and so sometimes that can designate the article, or sometimes it doesn't translate into English at all. Like, where, whereas they would use an article in the Greek, it, it doesn't translate into English with the article. It would get dropped, okay? But when referring to the supreme divinity versus a false god, um, he's always, our God is always going to be associated with an article, the God, okay? So, um, this, in the Old Testament, God comes from the Hebrew word Elohim and Jehovah. So I don't know if y'all remember from when we did the names of God. I think I mentioned that before. We might have to just do it again, okay? Ain't nothing wrong with redoing lessons. It's like, do you even remember? <laughs> and just because you can, you know, recite it doesn't mean you know it. Right? But that word, Elohim, right? Recognizing God as creator, Jehovah, the self-existent one. So in the Old Testament, that's where it's it's coming from. Okay, Elohim indicates his power and preeminence, whereas Jehovah is recognizing his unoriginated, immutable, eternal, and self-sustained existence. So let's let's take a look at that word and then those two words, uh, preeminence and immutable. Okay. <laughs> Because I really, you know, at least for me, I do have moments where it's like, eh, what did me? <laughs> there are plenty of times where, you know, again, it's like it's not that I'm that smart. I just, I use the tools that I got, okay? And so I have moments where I'm learning all types of things. I'm learning Hebrew, Greek, English. <laughs> all time. So preeminence. In my Webster's dictionary, is the quality or state of being preeminent, superiority. So, what is preeminent? Let's find out. Having paramount rank, dignity, or importance, outstanding, supreme, supreme divinity, right? The supreme divinity, outstanding. Paramount rank. Like, ain't nobody topping him because he's the most high God. Going back to what I said at the beginning of this lesson, my plans don't outrank God's. That's why it's his will, not my will. Right? Not my will, Lord. Your will be done. Not my plans, God, but your plans be done. Not my dreams but your dreams. Not my vision, but your vision, Lord. Be done. So even if you got an interrupted God, so I can humble myself and remember who it is that's running things, then so be it. Because you outrank me. Okay? Now let's look at the word immutable. Immutable. <clears throat> Excuse me. This word immutable, not capable of or susceptible to change. God does not change. Now, some people have looked at that like, okay, but he gets mad, his emotions change. Yes, his feelings change. And we need to praise God for that because imagine if God stayed angry with us, right? Like you wouldn't have committed a sin, an offense, 
that he clearly said was a sin, that's kind of, you know, and the wages of sin is death, and he had a hard heart. He was angry. In his wrath, he had decided to just unleash his wrath upon you. It's like, no, I'm not going to forgive them. They're hard-headed. I'm not going to forgive them at all. They don't learn anything. They never learn. They keep saying they're going to change. Oh, God, this time, this time, this time. When is, when is this time going to happen? Now, nah, forget that. They got to go. His attributes do not change. God is still faithful even when we're not. God is still good even when we're not. God still does the things that he said he was going to do even when we don't. God still fulfills his promises even when we backtrack on ours. God is still faithful and shows up on time even when we are late, when we don't show up at all, when we get flaky, wishy-washy, sometimes That's the part of God that does not change. His feelings, emotions can change. God was about to destroy them children of Israel until Moses went to pray for them, okay? And as it is, some of them still didn't make it. Right? Every single time you look, you look at the Bible and you see the people every time they went wayward, but the minute they sincerely repented and turned away from their sin and gave their hearts to God, God forgave them. Right? He was loving and kind towards them. So we need to remember that. Like, your God does not change. He doesn't flip the script on you. His attitude or his feelings towards certain things, well, we won't say his attitude either. His feelings towards certain things, right? His response will change, right? Scripture says, if I seek him with all my heart, if I seek his face with all my heart, and I'm sincere in that, I'm not just like, ooh, uh, hey, I know I did was wrong, but I mean, you can cut me some slack, right? No, when I come to him with that heart, that's like, God, I hurt you. I really messed up. And I know what I did was wrong. My God, I'm, I'm sorry. And I mean it. And whatever has to happen so that I don't end up back on this path again, I pray that you do that right now because I can't make it without you. Like, when we come with him with that heart, you can't fake that. You can fake that with other people, and we know people who do. But you can't fake that with God, right? And ladies, I don't know why that's coming up, <laughs> but y'all know good and well, you push that button too many times, right? And our heart starts to get hard. But what's wrong with her? What do you mean what's wrong with her? She's been telling you what's wrong, and you have not been listening. You have not been listening. So now she's mad. It's like, okay, you keep saying you're sorry, but you keep doing it. So you know what? Make your own food. Do, do your own laundry. <laughs> like that anger, right? Well, you can't stay there. Can't stay there. Again, it's like think about that. If God treated you the way you treat other people, if he held a grudge against you, how far do you think you would get? Would you even wake up tomorrow morning? You go to sleep, you wake up in the hospital like, oh, my gosh, you're finally awake. What do you mean? Well, you've been asleep for three months now. Three months? What do you mean? Three months. Some of y'all, the, the kind of anger and grudges that you hold, it'd be like years before God would finally be like, oh, I guess I'll wake them up today. Mm. Oh, nothing's going well for you? Oh, well, not my problem. Keep those things in mind. 
Okay, because when we start getting these attributes, it's going to get real. Okay. Now, I've gone over my time, but, you know, we at least had to, to get there right. Remember, at least this, Elohim, his power, his superiority, he is the supreme divinity. If you do not recognize God as the one who is literally the head of your life, it's going to show in your walk. I had I told y'all I had to have that lesson recently. You know, I'm sitting there getting offended. And again, I had to start laughing because it's like God looking at me like you said, not your will, my will, right? I outrank you. So did you mean that or did you not mean that when you was praying that in your prayers? What? Like, yeah, you right, God. My bad. I'm sorry. You know, you could have struck me down, too, because it's like, are you acting stupid with God? <laughs> the one who can literally speak a word and you stop breathing? That guy? And you wasn't scared at all? At all? Like, what? And even in that, like, that humility, like, ooh, yeah, I was really acting crazy with God. Wow. So recognizing his power, his preeminence. Again, God does not want you to be afraid of him, but we need to reverence him. You are going to respect him. Okay? <laughs> like, put some respect on his name. You better put some respect on his name. For real, for real. Right? Um, and that other part, right? Immutable. He does not change. He's still the same good God who was with you when times was just, you was on the high life, right? It was the highest point of your life. He's still a good God when it seems like everything is going wrong. He's eternal. He is forever. So we will spend the rest of our lives trying to get to know him, to be more and more acquainted with the one who loves us, right? And self-sustain. He really don't need you. He don't. But he wants you. He desires you. There's a difference. Because he's God all by himself, whether you believe in him or not. Right? I think we talked about faith before, right? My faith is faulty. Faith comes from God. Just because I choose to doubt and I live a life full of doubt doesn't make his faith, his power, any less uh, capable of doing things in my life. It's just a, a matter of me saying, okay, I accept it. I'm going to obey and I'm going to trust in him. And in that, I receive those things that he has me through the faith. But it doesn't make him any less God because I don't believe or, you know, I'm sitting there acting crazy or I make mistakes. He's still God with or without me. He's, going to be a, he's still going to be God after I leave here. So, you know. Things to, to hold on to. Now, the other scriptures, I want you to read these on your own. Okay? Uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 11. Acts chapter 19, verse 26. Acts chapter 28, verse 6. And 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. I'll read those again. Acts. Chapter 14, verse 11. Chapter 19, verse 26. Chapter 28, verse 6. And 1 Corinthians, chapter 8, verse 5. Okay. Now this next part that we're going to look at, we're going to start getting into the attributes of God. And keep in mind, um, there are attributes that God has that we share with him, but then there are divine attributes that only God has. Like that immutability, that immutable, eternal stuff, that's divine attribute. We ain't got that, okay? I ain't going to live forever. <laughs> like naturally speaking, I'm going to die. 
and I pray that when I make it, I will reign with him forever, you know, in life after death, right? But in generally speaking, no, I'm not eternal. I'm not an eternal being. I can die. I will die, okay? I'm definitely not immutable because I, I change, right? We can change. We can be changed. You don't have to stay the same person that you were before you came to Christ. I'm getting started again. (laughs) So those are divine attributes, and we're going to get into those next time. But for right now, we're going to pray out. So, Lord God, I thank you once again for another day. I thank you for your grace, your goodness, your love, your compassion, and your mercy, God. Lord, I pray that through these days, through these studies, God, that we would just draw closer and closer to you, that we would go from being acquaintances, God, to truly being your friend, that you would just become the love of our lives, God, that we would know you more and more each day, and we would learn to abide in you and your word. I pray that you would cover each and every single one of these women, each and every single person listening on today, Continue to be with them. Continue to speak to them, minister to their mind and their heart, God, and just lead us to fully surrender to you, to acknowledge you as the one true God over everything in our lives, including ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord, let your way be done in everything, God, in all things. Amen and amen. All right, ladies. Y'all take care. Have an awesome day. Uh, Join us again by calling this number for the Everybody Bible Study on Thursday at 530. And y'all be blessed. Bye.